Hi there, I'm Dave Brown for Teletrain. Today we're going to discuss centrifugal pumps. Now Webster's Dictionary defines centrifugal force as the force that tends to impel a thing or parts of a thing outward from a center of rotation. It's centrifugal force which throws you sideways as you go around a sharp curve in an automobile. The same force holds the water in this bucket when it's upside down. If we have a pan of water and we spin it like this. Centrifugal force will cause the water to move to the outside of the pan and then on up and out. If instead we put a paddle wheel like this into a pan of water and turn it, the water will be slung by centrifugal force to the outside as it was before. The paddle wheel we call an impeller since it impels or slings the water to the outside. Now let's look at individual droplets of water. The impeller is turning rapidly, and therefore centrifugal force causes the droplets to start moving very rapidly toward the outside of the impeller. Now as the droplet gets right here, let's say it freezes into a ball similar to a hailstone. If there's no housing to stop it, since it's traveling at a high speed, it will be thrown a good distance, but no useful work will be done. If we put something, say a toy car, into the path of travel, the ice balls will move the car. The velocity energy of the ice balls has been converted to force on the car. In a standard centrifugal pump, the housing, or volute as it's called, serves to convert much of the velocity energy in the water to pressure energy and or heat. Okay. Now we'll turn the impeller over so it's driven from the bottom. We'll have to put a seal around the shaft so there isn't leakage down the shaft. Now we put the pan on top and seal it. All right, now if we put an opening here, which will be the inlet, and one here, the outlet, we've constructed a centrifugal pump. The pressure here at the outlet isn't very great, but it is enough to force the water up into this bucket. What we have constructed is, of course, the simplest type of centrifugal pump, but the principles illustrated are those which make all centrifugal pumps work. In actual practice, many additional factors have to be taken into consideration. The impeller usually has curved blades like this, with a disc on one or both sides. If the disc is on one side like this, it's called an open impeller, while if it looks like this, it's called an enclosed impeller. The curved blades are inside here, similar to these. The shape of the curve on the blades of an impeller determine its flow rate, efficiency, and what pressure the pump will develop. These three factors are also affected by the speed at which the pump is running, and obviously by how large the pump is. Efficiency is the ratio of the hydraulic horsepower available at the outlet divided by the horsepower required to drive the pump. The impeller may be made of practically any metal or plastic or even glass depending on the liquid to be pumped. But for water service, it is usually made of brass or bronze. The case may also be made of almost any material, but it's got to be strong enough to withstand the pressure developed by the pump and is most frequently made of cast iron, steel, or bronze. You will note this case isn't shaped like our pan, but is narrow here and gets wider as it goes around to the outlet. This provides an easy path for the liquid to reach the outlet. As I said before, this part of the housing is called a volute. Centrifugal pumps are available in two styles, close coupled or motor mount and cradle or frame mount. The close coupled or motor mount gets its name from the fact that the impeller fits right on the end of the motor shaft. This type doesn't have any bearings except those on the motor. On the other hand, 
all of the cradle or frame mount types have bearings of some sort. These may be ball, roller, or sleeve, depending upon the application. The drive is then connected with some type of coupling. The most common type of small centrifugal pump is what is known as an in-suction vertical split case. The suction or inlet side is in the center like this, and the connections may be screwed like this one, or flanged as you see here. A pump with the very same performance characteristics is usually available either motor mount or cradle mount. They are also usually available with either a stuffing box or a mechanical seal. We'll explain seals in just a minute. Centrifugal pumps are also available with a horizontal split case, which looks like this. As you see, the pump case is split right through the middle. And once the bolts that hold it together have been removed, the top half can be lifted right off, exposing all the parts. Here is the stuffing box. Here are the bearings. Here is the impeller. Notice right here that the horizontal split case has a suction opening here, but it divides and goes to both sides of the impeller. The discharge is here. The horizontal split case pump is considered a more heavy duty unit than the vertical split case, and the comparative ease of maintenance is obvious. Vertical centrifugal pumps are essentially just regular centrifugal pumps which have been turned on end, but with an extension for the motor to get it up out of the liquid being pumped. They are widely used as sump pumps, such as would be used to pump out a basement. Here is a type of vertical pump that is widely used as a process pump to mix or stir liquids in industrial manufacturing processes. There are several other configurations of centrifugal pump may take. For example, here's a submersible pump, which is really just a motor mount unit where pump, motor and all, is put right into the water being pumped. Here's an inline pump, which mounts right in the line through which the fluid is being pumped, and therefore it doesn't require a mounting base. Here is a self-priming pump, which again is really a simple centrifugal pump. It has a box built around the impeller to hold water, so it will be self-priming. Right here, I guess we'd better explain what we mean by the word priming. In this case, it means being full of fluid on the suction side. As you can see here, if we have a system set up like this, when we start the pump, the impeller is turning in air, and there's no way the water down here is going to jump up here into the pump. Okay, so what do we do? Well, we put a check valve in the line right here. This is a check valve. It's got a flapper in it, and it allows free flow in one direction and none in the other. One type of check valve, when used on the end of the line, is also called a foot valve. Okay, let's put our check valve in the system right here. Now we can come up here and pour water in until the pump and the suction pipe is full. We have now primed the pump. Okay, when we start the pump this time, since the impeller is surrounded by water, it pumps. The suction line is full, so water continues to flow. If the pump is stopped, the check valve keeps the pump and the suction line full. If, however, the check valve has a leak and lets the water drain out, we'll have to prime the pump again before it'll pump anything. One rule of thumb to remember is in general, you can't have more than 20 feet of lift on the suction side of a pump. That means that the distance from here to here can be no more than 20 feet. It's good practice to always have as little suction lift as possible. When the level of the liquid on the suction side is above the pump like this, we have what is called positive suction pressure, and the unit is said to have a flooded suction. Once a centrifugal pump has been properly installed, it normally operates with relatively little problem. However, as with all mechanical equipment, sooner or later it will require attention. One of the most frequent sources of trouble 
is the shaft seal. The seal does one of two things. If the pressure in the seal area is positive, then the purpose of the seal is to prevent the fluid from leaking out around the turning shaft. If the pressure at the seal is less than that of the outside air, then the seal serves to keep air from leaking into the pump. If air is leaking in, it can frequently be identified by a loud rattling noise. The most common types of seals are stuffing box and mechanical seal. The stuffing box is, much as the name implies, a box around a shaft which we stuff packing into. The packing may be of most any material which will work with the fluid being pumped. Asbestos, metal foil, Teflon, precast rubber, and impregnated fabric are a few of the more common. One of the disadvantages of a stuffing box is that in order to operate satisfactorily, it must have some leakage to lubricate the seal. Either that or some other provision must be made for lubrication. When an inexperienced mechanic sees a leak on a stuffing box and tightens the gland down until the leak stops completely, you're probably in for trouble. On the other hand, one advantage of this type seal is that if it starts to leak excessively, in an emergency, most anything, even an old sock, will serve as a temporary packing to get you by until a shutdown can be scheduled. Stuffing boxes are classified as solid packed or as those with a sealing cage. Just like it says, a solid pack simply has the stuffing box filled with packing. Solid packed is normally used when there's a positive suction pressure and a slight liquid leak will lubricate the packing. A sealing cage is used in most other applications. A sealing cage, or a lantern ring as it's sometimes called, is simply a ring, like this one, that's placed in the stuffing box to separate the packing. It is made of a material which will not be affected by the liquid being handled. The purpose of the cage is to serve as a point in the middle of the packing at which fluid can either be put in or taken out. Okay, here we have a cutaway view of a stuffing box. We have a sealing cage right here. Now let's assume that there's a negative pressure on the suction. That means that the pressure here inside the pump is less than the pressure of outside air. So instead of fluid trying to get out, Along the turning shaft here, air tries to get in. If we tighten up on the packing enough so that the air can't get in, then shortly the shaft gets hot because there isn't any lubrication between the packing and the shaft. All right, now let's make use of a sealing cage right here in the middle of the stuffing box. If we force a fluid in here, it will go both directions and provide the necessary lubrication while also effectively sealing off the pump from the outside air. If the sealing fluid comes from a system other than the pump, it's called an external seal. The external pressure should be at least 10 pounds per square inch above the suction pressure. If on the other hand, we take the fluid right from the high pressure side of the pump like this, then it's called an internal seal. Internal seals are normally used when pumping clean, cool water. When gritty or corrosive fluids are handled, there should be an external seal with a cool, clean liquid supplied to the stuffing box. When the pump is handling petroleum products, a stick type of lubricant is frequently used, which is forced into the cage area by screwing down on a plunger like this. This type of lubrication also works well for many general service applications. When the temperature of the liquid being pumped is higher than the normal rating of the packing, a circulating type stuffing box, which looks like this, is frequently used. Cool, clean liquid enters here, passes through the sealing cage, and then goes out here on the other side. There should be a valve on the discharge line so that a pressure of approximately 10 pounds per square inch can be maintained in the seal area. It's important that maintenance personnel understand the purpose of the sealing cage. 
since care must be used to make sure that when repacking the stuffing box, the cage is placed directly under the tapped hole. Sometimes there's a very high positive suction pressure, and therefore the pressure at the suction side is higher than the stuffing box can satisfactorily handle. In this case, we use what is known as a bleed-off bushing. This is just a special type of sealing cage designed to fit all the way in the bottom of the stuffing box like this. Now, part of the pressure is relieved or bled off, as it's called, through the bleed-off connection and returned to some point of low pressure in the system. This bleeding off of part of the pressure in this area right here means that the packing won't have to handle as much pressure. Sometimes when the leakage is inflammable or forms a poisonous gas or maybe it flashes to steam, we may use what is known as a smothering gland. It looks like this. We introduce water right here, which washes or smothers the liquid or fumes which are moving along the rotating shaft. The discharge is here on this side. Okay, now for a look at the other primary method of sealing a pump shaft. It's called a mechanical seal. In many applications, the mechanical seal has proven to be a more satisfactory method of sealing the rotating shaft than the stuffing box. The mechanical seal is made in two sections. We slip this one on a shaft and seal it there. And this one we seal into the housing now, as the shaft turns, these two polished surfaces are held in contact by the spring. When sealing a pump, which is handling water at relatively low temperatures and pressures, frequently one face is ceramic while the other is carbon. Many other materials are used for special applications. The selection of these should usually be referred to the manufacturer for his recommendations. The faces on the sealing surfaces right here are lubricated by a very small leakage, which may be only a drop every few minutes. Usually, this has evaporated by the time it reaches the outside of the seal, so that the mechanical seal is, for all practical purposes, leak-free. Because the sealing is dependent on these two surfaces being absolutely smooth, you've got to really be careful when installing a replacement seal to make sure these surfaces aren't damaged in any way. When handling clear liquids, a single seal usually works fine. But when handling gritty materials, an auxiliary seal may be used like this. With a mechanical seal here, and now we inject water or grease into the area between the two seals, and this serves to lubricate and cool the sealing surface. Two mechanical seals are also used back to back for this type service. They too must have water or grease injected into the area between the two seals. One problem with a mechanical seal as compared to a stuffing box is that once it does start leaking, the pump will usually have to be shut down immediately and the seal replaced. Now let's leave seals and discuss what is a very important item especially on large size pumps that have stuffing box seals. It's the shaft sleeve. Here is a shaft sleeve. It's simply a cylinder of metal which is machined to screw on the shaft and serve as a wear surface at the point where the packing would rub on the shaft. It can be hardened if necessary, and if it does get grooves in it, scores we call them, then we simply have to replace the sleeve and not the whole shaft. Since shaft sleeves are usually an add-on item when it comes to pricing the pump, they are sometimes omitted to arrive at a more competitive price. This is in the long run usually a costly omission. One other item which is similar in function to the shaft sleeve is the wear ring. On larger pumps, and especially those handling gritty material, a replaceable wear ring like this is put in the pump housing right here so that the ring may be renewed without having to replace the whole big housing. Many manufacturers also offer replaceable impeller wear rings, which go right here, and extend the life of the impeller. 
Up until now, we've talked about single-stage centrifugal pumps, which means that they have only one impeller. With one impeller, we are limited in maximum pressure to something in the range of 500 feet, or about 220 pounds per square inch, and to considerably less than this with most pumps. All right, let's say we need 300 pounds per square inch pressure, and that the pumps we have available will only develop 150 pounds. We could do this and let one pump discharge into the suction of the other. Since each pump will develop 150 pounds per square inch, we would have 150 pounds here and 300 here. If the casing of the second pump is strong enough to handle the 300 pounds pressure, this would work okay, except you might have some packing problems with the stuffing box on the second pump due to the 150 pound suction pressure. At first glance, this may not seem exactly right to you, and more than once in the past, we've had to actually connect up the pumps to prove it so. But anyway, just take my word for it, the pressures do add up. In actual practice, we usually use a two-stage pump, like this, with two impellers, here and here, in one housing. Fluid comes in here, and discharges here to the suction side of this impeller, where it is boosted on up to its final pressure. You will notice the bleed off line right here, which goes back to the suction side of the first stage. It's used to reduce the high pressure here on the second stage packing. Three or more stages are possible depending on the final pressure desired. This ends part one of centrifugal pumps.